All right, welcome to After Chat, episode six. This one we're entitling Action. I have episode titles. This is still an amazing thing that I can get that far. So, you may notice uh, as we cut to a pet wider view that the studio is set up a little bit differently this week. There are three of us here. So, I'm Tom Model from Aperture to Pixels, as always. Hi, I'm Ryan Pease from Peace Point Photography. Glad to have you back. And joining us in the studio today is... I'm Jesse Crichton. All right, we have Jesse here to answer some questions about some, uh, some film stuff, DSLR videography, and some projects he's working on. Uh, hopefully he'll chime in here or there as we go along the way. Uh, but we'll jump right into some camera news. Uh, this one's all you, Canon guy. This is all me. As much as I like to rip on Nikon, I will also be the first one to admit when Canon screws up. Um, the 1DX and allegedly the 1DC, because they use the same focusing mechanism, have known issues in, shi in focusing in below zero temperatures. Uh, not the, Much like our D4S review uh, it doesn't really apply to too many people watching this, except maybe my fraternity brother Moose, who does shoot on a 1DX and shoots in Wyoming, so I kind of want to hear if he's had problems shooting that, because it does get cold there in the winter. Um, basically what happens is the, the cameras will fail to autofocus when it gets below zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, for most people, probably never going to notice this, not too many people take their cameras out, but uh, since the 1DXs and 1DCs yeah. are professionals, they will take it out like this. Um, Apparently it has to do with the, what they're calling the locking claw of the sub mirror, uh, which when it gets cold enough, I guess just shrinks just enough to go around the, the locking pin that's supposed to keep it from getting out of place. Uh, basically, you send it into Canon, they're gonna fix it. Uh, but the one thing, and this is the thing that, that people have noticed, only if you complain about the fact that it has problems focusing in the cold specifically, will they fix this issue. Otherwise, they're going to look at it, they're going to do it in the, in the repair center, and they're just going to send it back to you and say, no, it's fine. So uh, if you are using a 1DX or a 1DC, make sure you mention that when you send it in, specifically that it's in cold weather for them to handle that properly. It always takes a lot of whining to fix things. It's yeah, just... With everybody. It doesn't matter if it's camera or not. It always takes a lot of complaining to get anything fixed these days. Well, makes me feel better. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, uh, the Nikon D600, their dates, so we talked about this briefly, they're actively replacing them with 610s. Yeah. I, I know my personal experience, the person who has two 600s, they're both getting 610s in the next week. Wow. They're shipping out 610s quicker than it took them to fix the first ones. Well, at least they're doing it quickly. It's, yeah. It's well, the time. It's the amount of time it takes them to do even register cameras, that's a really an issue. Yeah, I mean, you, you've had some fun dealing. Well, it took them three weeks. It took them a week and a half to put the camera into the system at Nikon, which is way too long for a professional camera. Absolutely. Especially where you were counting on that coming back and knowing oh, yeah. where it was along the way. No, uh, the best part about my, my 600 experience was when they shipped it back without giving me the tracking number. So it just kind of showed up, signature confirmation on my house. Like, hey, there's a camera. <laughs> so the other thing Tom marks for news is, I don't know if you've seen the Skydiver helmet cam footage of what is supposedly a meteorite. So in Norway, the guy's name is Anders Hellstrup. He was skydiving, uh, just kind of a standard skydive where he has two different cameras on his helmet, forward facing wide angle camera and a backwards facing, looked like a, what was, there's another brand. So one was a GoPro, one was a different, different action camera. He says he feel, felt something happen when he was skydiving. Uh, he checked, checked the footage afterwards and saw a rock. So a rock is a rock. But apparently he calcul they calculated out how quickly it was going. It was, you know, terminal velocity, 168 miles an hour, whatever it was. Yep. And it's shaped like a meteorite. So they, I guess they've, they've come to the conclusion, experts and meteorite people and whoever the hell those people are, um, they, they say it's the first footage of a dark meteorite. So after, after meteorite burns up, explodes, little bits and shrapnel fly all over the place. It's the first, first time somebody's seen like an actual piece of a dark I rock. I didn't think that was even possible. Uh, neither did anybody else until he was <laughs> like, so. Sure it wasn't just a rock. That's what I, see, I, now I've watched the video a couple of times and until like I, I hear someone confirm it, it's a rock. 
it's a rock, it's a rock, it yeah. was a rock. But he, you know, he shows you where the plane was in the sky, like where the plane peeled off, where the other skydiver is. And the rock is this big. Like it's not, Jesus. it's a softball. So it couldn't have been packed in his chute. Like, no, nah, you would have noticed something like that. Yeah. And he, yeah. it wouldn't have deployed right because it weighs 30 pounds. So it's, it's a big ass rock falling from the sky. I don't know what else you call it. But, but a meteorite, an actual meteorite, is going to be going thousands not of after, miles an Not hour. after it explodes. So this is after it, it explodes and just goes, and now it's just free fall. It's all just thermal velocity after huh. it's no longer. I guess it's possible. That's I, a I mean, one. it's the footage is cool. It's obviously a rock falling out of clear blue sky. Yeah, we'll have to put a link to that. Yeah. When we, uh, when we put that up, because it is some really cool footage. Yeah, it, I mean, they sense it like, they sensationalize it a little bit, and being in America and watching anything ever, you just, you doubt everything. <laughs> like the History Channel, yeah. you know. Well, anything on the History Channel now is terrible, but. Aliens. Yeah, or Templar was the <laughs> Knights Templar. <laughs> That's a terrible the Mexican story. Mexican cartel? <laughs> it's, the, the History Channel is terrible. Well, there hasn't been history on the History Channel in years. I uh, see, now I, I started, this, this is the worst tangent ever. I started watching it was like, it was unearthing ancient America, or ancient something, secrets okay. or something. And they're like, they're going through, they found these lead crosses and they, they were really cool. They very well like engraved lead, lead swords and crosses in America, which were old. They had like, they had stuff growing on them, like crystals growing on them. Okay. The guy's going through, he's like, he's using geology, like forensic geology to figure out how old these are. And he's like, yeah, it seems, the guy seems like he knows what he's doing. And then it takes that like sharp right turn into <laughs> insane land. <laughs> so they come back from commercial and he pulls into an Exxon station and it's like this double barred cross on one of the, the pieces of lead. And he pulls into the Exxon station and the Exxon has two X's. And the X's <laughs> form a double barred cross. They just happen to look like <laughs> no, and then, so I was like, okay, he's just using this as a coincidence thing where, like, stuff, stuff could happen in the past. And then they launch into a 20-minute explanation of the man who designed the Exxon logo was a Templar. And the Exxon <laughs> logo is a double-barred cross over a blue bar, which means that the Knights Templar came to America over the ocean. And it's like, it just, it's like a train wreck. You just can't look away. Oh, man. It's like, I love I was, that stuff, though. I was like, it's a forensic geologist. He's like, he's thinking about things. And then he goes, and the Templars and the Exxon logo. It's like, ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> I always wanted to do this. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm all out of Index order. cards so I can do the David Letterman throw before uh, he retires. Yeah. Maybe on his last day. See, I, I, I like the uh, uh, John Stewart crumple and throw. I like the John Stewart drawing on things. Yeah. 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 So this is an interesting one that that's come up that I'm uh, personally kind of curious about. Uh, Sony this week unveiled a prototype of a curved sensor. Now what they're claiming is the curved sensor and it's accompanying glass will allow for faster apertures without taking a hit on image quality. Uh, basically the patents date back to 2012 but the uh, Sony officials did a presentation on it uh, just recently. Uh, according to them a curved CMOS sensor and integrated lenses will make for an almost zero light loss in the corners of the images. So it's supposed to mimic closer to the human eye where our eye is curved and that's why we don't have vignetting in our, in our own vision. Um, because the lens field uh, is curved, it is, I'm trying to make sense out of the numbers here, they can get better f-stops than they can right now and yeah. you won't have uh, you won't have on the corners. You won't have the softness. You won't have the vignetting. It'll be almost like a perfectly flat image, even at wide open apertures and at wide angles, which sounds pretty amazing, actually. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, you'll get some of those wide angle photographers who are like, "No, I like the fact that my image is all screwed up on the edges." Well, there'll always be a certain amount of distortion in that, but it's. It's, it's yeah, it's to be interesting. It's supposed to significantly reduce it. Like you're going to be able to shoot it like. 14 millimeter and it'll still look like you're at 35. Hmm. Which is its own distortion. It's like there's, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it's, that should be really cool. So I'm, I'm excited to see what they do with that. And if they keep making them even smaller and smaller, you'll see it in just about everything. So. Yeah, that's one of those things I, I could see applied mobile first before even other stuff. 
because yeah. I feel like that's got to be massive in an SLR body, right? Mm. The sensor compartment's got to be this big. If the curve, yeah, the curve be, is even 10%, yeah, it's going to have to be a deeper huge. sensor. And you might see, even see it in mirrorless before you see it in SLR. Uh, if you even ever see it in SLR, yeah, you the might, mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Because the mirror is not going to give you accurate to what you're seeing on the sensor. That's anymore. actually true. It may never see it in SLR, especially with Sony. Yeah. Using it. Mm. Mm. Sony's going heavy on the mirrorless right now. So yeah, it's working. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Staying with Sony, they have introduced a full, the full frame A7S 4K camera. This is in the addendum. Yay. I was say, did I throw that paper away? I don't no. <laughs> no, I, I just jumped to the addendum, which has two extra pieces of news that I, I was really excited oh, about yeah. this week. Um, Sony announced the 4K A7S joining the A7 and A7R family. Um, it is a 4K video camera, basically, on a full frame CMOS sensor, so full 35 millimeter sensor. Uh, it's running at, the, basically, the, the key stats here are it does. 12.2 effective megapixels when it's doing photos. So a little lower than what you're seeing on high-end DSLRs, but they're touting it as a video camera that happens to take pictures, not the other way around. Yeah, and 12.2 is still enough to do oh, yeah. everything anyway. Uh, 4K video at um, 60 frames a second. I had to actually go look that up. Uh, wide ISO sensitivity, 50 to 409,600. That's the same as the D4S now. <laughs> So it's got the same <laughs> low light capabilities as the D4S. You wrote four million. What? In the notes, you wrote four million six hundred. Oh, I, I do that. <laughs> um, aliens. The, aliens. They have, aliens are affecting my Google Drive account. Um, minimal noise in low light. So again, just like the D4S, and it will be compatible with the entire line of E mount lenses, which is what they're putting out right now. Which means. You're not going to have to invest in all new lenses if you're running Sony already. Yeah. Um, price point, still not announced yet. I assume it's going to be quite expensive. I don't know. I mean, what's, what's the A7R? It's not that that's a not a super expensive body. That's true. It's in line with the six, 610 and the yeah. 6D. But it's this 4K. I think it's going to bump up a bit from there. I, I, I think it'll be like where around Panasonic's new 4K camera is in like the 3500 range. I mean, the one they announced at CES, so I, Panasonic has horrible naming conventions, so I don't even remember what it's called. <laughs> but. Yeah, so the other, other piece of news that he has stashed away somewhere in the back of this is the, um, the price tag in the Sigma 50mm 1.4 ART. So if you haven't seen this tech news on the 50mm 1.4 ART, it's Sigma's new attempt at taking on Zeiss as a third-party high, ultra-high-end option for lenses. Um, the 50 millimeter 1.4 art is sharp, as sharp or sharper than any other 50 millimeter lens for SLR 35 millimeter frame bodies. Everyone is expecting at least $1,200. Some reports uh, had it as high as 17 last yeah. time. So they were expecting at least $1,200 plus on the price tag of this, and Sigma kept it under 1,000 at 950. So that's $950 for a thing that's competing with lenses that are $2,000 easily. Easily two thousand dollars. In, in fact, the, I, I went and looked. DxO got a preview version of the lens, and it beats on on the the one D body and the one D X body. It beats the the current version of the Canon fifty in just about every aspect. Oh yeah. The only thing the Canon's got is it goes to one two instead of one four, but which is negligible. Which is nothing point. basically, because it's so sharp at one four that being at one four with the one two, it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. It beats it in like just about every stat, and it's half the price. It's yeah, so Sigma has been punching above their weight belt for a while. Yeah, the third parties are crazy. Yeah, and you know, Tamron and Sigma are, are really making you think third party a lot these days because they're they're doing it, yeah. keeping up there. Yeah, especially for the film, especially for a lot of video video production stuff. That the transmission rates are so much better than a lot of the olds, mm. even normal lenses. Yeah. So you might see some Sigma lenses when we're shooting stuff in the future. Sounds good. Uh, I got one little one here. Uh, lens Baby announced a 5.8 millimeter f3.5 circular fisheye. It's it's kind of an obnoxious little lens. I mean, I know Lens Baby gets a lot of crap because they make a lot of crap. <laughs> but this one actually looks like it's a lot of fun because it has a 185 degree view angle. It can actually see behind itself because it's a, it's a, a spherical lens on the front. That's pretty cool. 
So it actually it actually catches and it, it they did it by design. It actually catches the outer edge of the ring to give you a little reflection in, and it has a specific huh. artistic element the way they did it. Uh, the pictures they have up online are really funny. Plus, there's a focal length of one half of an inch, like a focal distance. <laughs> yeah, you could be. I, I, you could be this close, and it'll still be able to focus. It's, but it is meant for a uh, crop sensor, yeah, which think. would make it an eight millimeter when it's when it's used up fully. Uh, but it will mount to. They did make it flat enough to mount to uh, full frames. You're just going to get more black around the edge. I mean, yeah. you're, as the picture takes now, you get black around the edge because it it makes the images a perfect circle in the center of the. Oh yeah, yeah, that's cool though. It is cool. It, it's they're pricing it at three hundred. You can pre-order it from B and H right now, uh, which is expensive for a lens baby product. But the reviews they're getting on it, as far as that niche of people who yeah. actually shoot, you know, things with fish eyes and things, are they're getting some good reviews. That that niche will probably actually pick up quite a few of them. Yeah, it's, I mean that's just like anything lens baby. It's, it yeah. should be weird and interesting. Cause there's no reason to make a normal product, yeah. right? No, they don't need to make a normal product. But this one actually looks like it could be fun to play with. Yeah. All right. So where'd you put the rest of this? The rest of this. Um, well, one uh, last piece of, of actual camera news is Canon released the T5 this week, not the T5i, they've, it's, or the 1200D if you're in the rest of the world. Um, what? Oh, keep going. <laughs> which is a slight improvement over the T4, as it should be. Uh, but the big thing they did with the T5 is they introduced the Canon Companion app. So not only do you get your, you know, printed and bound camera manual, you get a full interactive user's guide on your phone, but it also includes something I want to play with, which is a random, it, it, it's in, they call it the inspiration, <laughs> the Canon inspiration, and it picks three random things, a, a subject, a point of view, and a suggestion on style. So it's like, it could randomly pick things like, take a picture of a flower from a child's point of view, you know. At night. At night <laughs> or something like that. I, I, that's why I want to play with it. Uh, I actually went onto the Apple Store and the Google Store to try and download it because it's, it's, it's a free app, not available in the US yet. I'm sure it's on the internet though. Oh, I'm sure it is. You can get it in the UK, you can get it in Asia, you can get it. <laughs> We'll find it afterwards. We'll, play we'll with find it. it and play with it and have some fun with it. But it looks like a lot of fun. And even if it's just for the inspiration, just to be able to say, I don't know what I want to shoot today, and just hit it and have it slot machine up and give you a couple of... We should make one of those. We should just make one of those that's like completely absurd. Oh, we definitely should. Do we know anyone who knows how to make apps? I had somebody ask me that the other day. Not make really. App, just make a wheel. A good old wheel of death. Just spin it. We should get like three wheels. Yeah. We, we should get three wheels. In fact, that should be its own program. Us yeah. using the three wheels. <laughs> I like it. All right. So that takes care of our uh, out of the house camera news. Yes, I'm, I'm still looking at your Exxon logo. <laughs> so, Mr. Ryan, wedding season is upon us. It's getting there. You got any, any big plans? Any uh, you, you pretty much booked up all summer at this point? I'm second shooting a lot. I don't have a lot of first shooter stuff booked, but right. I'm second shooting a lot of Saturdays. You can say wedding season, Ryan. I'll see you in October, sir. Nah, shit. <laughs> that, that, that's pretty much life. I mean, I, I kind of expect we're either going to have to move recording this to accommodate you. Oh, I'm free a lot of Sundays, so it's... Well, it's I like that, or I'm just going to have to get guests in every week to sit No, see. It's, <laughs> it's not too, too bad. I'm looking for other stuff to fill in during the week, especially. Because I could always use more stuff to do, but yep. second shooting's booked pretty heavily. Well, that's good. Though. Yeah, it's something. It's good to be getting out there and. Yep. Yo, I'll we'll have to rant about wedding photography at some point. Cause oh yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, that's the Matt Norris web web episode. <laughs> yeah. When we get Matt in here, we'll just we'll do like we did uh, a couple weeks ago with the why we're insane. It'll be the one topic episode. Yeah. We'll get Matt in here and we'll do that. Um, why weddings are insane. Why weddings are insane. Yeah. Because I've shot with both of you now, and and that's different. Yeah, like the way the way we shoot stuff is so different. It's not even. Oh yeah. Um, let's see, what else has gone on in the studio? We're doing some film work around here. I don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what I'm talking about? Oh, that's a good thing oh, we brought Jesse this? in. Hi. So. Hi Jesse. Hi Jesse. Hi Ryan. Hi Tom. 
So we brought Jesse in because we've been doing a lot of uh, DSLR film work with him. Because Jesse makes movies. I, I try to, anyway. The goal is to eventually make a movie. So the goal for Jesse... You've made a couple of good films, though. Uh, Short films, music videos, yeah. things like that. Yeah, yeah, they're okay. They're funny. They, they're funny. They're okay. Well, the the one you did recently for school, the uh... that's my favorite. Yeah, that was uh, the the House of Leaves. See, I always want to call it opening. I always want to call it Leaves of Grass, which is the Walt Whitman book, and I yeah, know that's wrong. That one's a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. But yeah, I really like the way that came out. That, that oh, yeah, was really I love good. That. So. Link to it. Make sure you link to it. We'll link to it. That, that's on your uh, Jesse Crichton YouTube page? It's on page. my standard. Like, everything goes on the same YouTube All right. channel. Excellent. So, I've known you for well over a decade at this point, but... Well over one. Try nearly two at this point. Almost two decades now. <laughs> uh, but, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your, your little... Your bit, of a, bit, of a, bit about your background... You know, I know you've done some, some camera work before. I know you know because, and I know you've uh, done some film work and things like that. But just just give us kind of a little background of, of what you've done. Uh, sure. Um, like we said at the top of the show, my name is Jesse Crichton. I am currently a graduate student in media studies at Rhode Island College, and a few years back, I earned a degree in film from the University of Rhode Island. And I don't know how much background you could say I actually have aside from my academic experiences in, you know, just learning editing techniques and putting together my silly little music videos that you can find all of them on my YouTube channel. All right. Which I'm sure Tom will. I will gladly will link, link to, to all but one of them, the one that I'm in. Oh, no, that's the best one. <laughs> if you like Team America World Police, <laughs> Tom is in the montage video. I am. Um, it is. Uh, it is quite a fun video. We I had a lot of fun with the kids shooting that. But, so, why is it you want to make films? That's a really terrible question. Well, I'm a terrible <laughs> interviewer, so... Why do you like to make fish sticks? I don't like to make fish sticks. I like to make <laughs> breaded fish portions with random flavors. Oh, I see. I see. Um, no, well, I, actually, I, mean, I like to make fish sticks because it's fun. But See, there you go, because it's fun. Uh, a slightly better answer than that, I think, is... It's just a medium that's really always spoken to me. I get it, it moves me. And then as, as a job, as a potential career, just the intersection of art and science and storytelling. Science. And the way that a, an epic film can just move the world in more ways than one. Than, oh, yeah. than one. You know, you look at, and my favorite example is, the, is Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy. The way that he brought together basically the entire nation of New Zealand to make those films mm. and transform the landscape and do whatever he did. It's just amazing. And he touched so many lives just by making the films. And then he puts them out there and he touches lives even further, changes lives through telling these stories. And I think it's, it's that kind of experience that really draws me to filmmaking is the way that you can get... All of these, you know, a good film, a good big budget film, hundreds, maybe thousands of the most talented people in the world together oh, to tell an incredible story. All right. Well, I mean, that's way better than my answers to why I like to make fish sticks. <laughs> now, if you ask me why I like to take pictures, I could give you a big story, but we're interviewing you here, not me today. Well, we could. Uh, Tom, why do you like to take pictures? Because I like to capture people and the way they work and the way they think. A big net. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, what, what led us into this interview a little bit was the fact that I was telling Ryan we were doing some film work in the studio here, yeah. and we're actually working on what, your current project now. Uh, so tell me a little bit about Exposure, this project you're working on. All right. Well, like I said, I'm a, I'm a graduate student in media studies at RIC, uh, Rhode Island College, mm -hmm. and my project this semester is a short film. It's going to end up being... It's going to push 15 minutes at this point, which is <gasps> way longer than it should. No, it should be half that, but but I like the script. Oh, this is a really good script. I'm, yeah. I'm excited yeah. about this. Yeah, so I just wanted an excuse to work out some of my editing, editing techniques and an excuse to buy uh, Premiere CC for the year, so I figured I'd put together a film. And I put out a call for scripts on my Facebook page 
few months ago, and one of my friends that I actually work with at Rhode Island College said, oh, hey, by the way, I'm a writer, and here's four scripts that you can look at. And I was like, holy <laughs> shit. And I read through a bunch of them and picked the one that I thought I could present the best at this moment in time. There's one I actually liked a little bit better, but it would have involved, like, renting a fast food restaurant for a couple of days to shoot oh, yeah. in and whatever. But just, I'm all over logistical stuff like oh, that. Oh, I would love to do it. It just wasn't what I wanted to work on right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this one is called Exposure, and it's about someone's first experience uh, in cognitive behavioral therapy to treat obsessive compulsive disorder. It's about her first few kind of therapy sessions going through that. And it's, it's a really interesting script. It comes from, as I understand, a very personal experience. And I really can't wait to film it and get it out there for people to see. Awesome. I don't know why you're tapping That's the, the timer. That's don't. the timer for the cameras. Yeah. Um, which means nothing now, but it's fine. Okay. <laughs> so, which do you prefer doing when, when you're working on the film? Do you like to be behind the camera? Do you prefer to be directing, producing? Never in front of the camera. Like this. This is terrible. Okay. Well, I, that's why I didn't even put that as an option, because I figure you're not going to be Kevin Smith and put yourself in front of him behind the camera. No, not until I have his degree of success. All right. But, so do you like, so you, you mentioned editing. Yeah. As far as... Do you like to get behind the camera and actually plan the shots, or do you like to just edit? Or obviously, directing is going to be part of this because you're gonna, you're in charge of the whole thing. I have very you you know you know me. I have very little patience for the technical aspects of photography. Like I just want to like honestly set it to auto, push the button, and see what the fuck happens. I want it to just come through. You know, um, that's why I talk to people like you because while I'm thinking of ten other things. You're going to take the time to get the shot right and make it look nice. So I really appreciate that. This is true. That. This is um, as far as I'm like forward to. my favorite part of the process. Uh, I'll let I'll let you know this time again next year once I've been through my <laughs> thesis and I've actually been doing it for a year. But I think actually directing, and it goes back to what I was saying about you know why do I make films? It's that opportunity to to lead people and to put those crews together and all right just you know mastermind the entire thing i really really dig the idea of that process you know because there's so much more to it than just doing the shoot or just casting actors or any one part of it you know and the oh, yeah. director's the guy who gets to put it all together and work his ass off doing it and try to invent some kind of co cohesive artistic vision at the same time. All right. Yeah. Uh, that, that actually sounds really good. And then editing is just way, like, super zen for me. I love to just sit there in front of Premiere or whatever and just cut it together. Because if, if I've done my job right up until that point, that part's way easy. Really fun. All right. Yeah, because I, I do some editing... And, you know, like, I edit this, and... Hey, you've been editing these shows together since I haven't had time. Yeah, and I have a lot of respect for you being able to edit like that, because I I like editing this because it's linear. I just drop all the cameras in and just pick which shot I want as I'm going <laughs> along. And it's more like live editing that way. But I think if I had to actually sit there and pick, okay, I want this shot, and I want this shot, and I want this shot, and I want this take of this shot, and this, I probably wouldn't be able to do that. That would probably drive me nuts. Oh, uh, you think so? I, 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 I can't wait to do that. With the, with, after we sh actually start shooting exposure and we get some different takes of our two actresses or actors, whatever term you prefer, uh, going through this script and giving their take on it, I, I can't wait to see what comes from it. Oh, I'm excited because I'm going to build some, uh, some fun toys to play with there. Um, one thing I'm going to build is a roller out of an old skateboard. Oh, fun. So, yeah. Do you have, like, a, that's... They have it at Hunt's photo video. It's it's literally it's like it's a roller and it's marketed as a skateboard. Basically, it's a skateboard. It's a skateboard. <laughs> it's a it's a metal frame with four skateboard wheels. Yeah, nice. I actually what I was planning on doing was um, just going to Walmart and grabbing a, uh, a ten dollar skateboard, a kid skateboard, so it's already smaller, and just mounting a tripod head on top of it. Yeah. Actually, what I should tr what, sh what I should price out building is an actual track. The track makes it more expensive. For, for doing a dolly shot? Yeah. All, all you need to do 
for the track is one inch PVC and a bunch of couplers, and you just lay it out straight. But then you have to build the cart that fits onto the track. There was um, a good. Um, but seriously, it's like a board of wood, and you need like eight skateboard wheels. There was a good IKEA them. track. Did you see any of that stuff? No. If you buy it, there's a curtain rod set, which is like four feet long, I think, and it has a running, a running track to it, and it's actually pretty cheap. Right, but I want something I can lay out and like you stand on the cart with your camera and someone pushes you. Yeah. <laughs> Do like a really nice long dolly in shot on something. Yeah, it's, it's, I've seen a lot of the home, I have problems with PVC. I've used it uh, on another film shoot I was part of once and it worked really well. Hmm. I was at the... Uh... It was called Team Lunch, and oh, okay, it never saw the light of day. All right. I don't, know, I don't know what happened to it. They did pay me for my work, which was oh, nice. Good. I got 75 whole dollars, but I, I've never seen a finished product. There are a couple of shots. I found them a couple months ago. A couple <laughs> of shots survived and are part of the director's uh, reel on Vimeo. Ah. All right. Cool. So, yeah. you, so, so you have done this, and you made some money off of it already. Yeah, $75. <laughs> <laughs> Some musician too. Then if I've made seventy five dollars in a parade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and one last question, just because I've worked with you both in video and in film, and we have—I know you and I have—and in kitchens and, and, and in many other places. <laughs> uh, but but we have—I I noticed one thing between the the stuff I've had you shoot with me in it and the stuff I've shot. Um, we have two totally different styles when it comes to getting people in a frame. And, uh, you know, I, I take, I frame people more like it's a portrait because I'm coming from the photography side. So I try and get a lid of the background in as long as the background is part of the story as well. Whereas I've noticed with the videos that, that I've shot with you, it's much more on the person. You know, much closer up on the person than, <clears throat> than getting the whole scene. Uh, do you think that's really more of your style? Is that something you're aiming for? Or is that just something you were playing with? It's, it's definitely intentional. It's part okay. of my aesthetic. I don't know where it comes from, but like if I have an actor I'm working with, yep. I want them to be the centerpiece. So like I want their face to fill the frame. Cut off the top of their head, focus on just the face, narrow depth of field so we can't see anything else. Like I want to showcase that actor. And I feel it's not too uncommon in, in modern cinema either. I think no, there, there's I, a, I lot, think of a lot of directors and uh, photographers do that today in cinema. No, yeah, well, no, there definitely is a lot of that in, in cinema. I guess it's just, I might be on the outlier, one of the outliers there where I still try and frame it like it's a photograph as opposed to framing it like it's film. Fair so enough. I, so maybe that's my style. Maybe the question should be the other way. Why don't I do that? But it's something we'll because, have to work through. Because you hmm. never set out with the goal of being a director of photography and film or anything hmm. like that. You set off with the goal of being a photographer this and if you true. shot photographs the way that I want to shoot film no one's going to want your photographs. That's true that's very true. Yeah, yeah. it's I have one of those things where you try and not bring preconceived perception of what you do usually to shoots. The same thing I, I would do for video a lot of the time is I try and not plan a lot of that specific shot stuff. You, you plan the, the mechanics of the shots, what you need out of the shots and then the actual style once you're there I usually let the moment speak for itself. Yeah which sometimes is freaky on shoots because I just bring people places and then figure it out. <laughs> so that's not always the best thing to do, but it, it lets you do different things. Lets, instead of bringing your, your package to the, to the table, you're just showing up and crafting whatever you want out of that. Yeah, and I do dig that idea as part of the process. Like I, the, the idea of like, you know, creating my shot list with accompanying uh, storyboards saying, this is exactly what we're gonna do, do not deviate. I'm sure it's efficient, but it doesn't sound like fun to me. Like, I want the chance to be creative on set. Mm. I, I, I'm perfectly okay walking in with a very loose idea of what I'm gonna do. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that, I think that's gonna make shooting with you a lot of fun too. And from what I can tell from talking to people who have done acting before, is I like, have some ties to theater, directors who are more fun to work with tend to get better actors. That's interesting. It's, it's true of everything. Yeah. It's like photographers who are more fun to work with. I'm not get. sure what that says about me. One of my favorite directors is Stanley Kubrick, and he hated <laughs> actors. Oh, yeah. He viewed them as props. It was kind of disgusting. But the work he got out of some of them was amazing. Look at yeah. The Shining. Oh, my God. 
but that was also, you know, 20, 30 years ago that he was doing it like that. And these are people I'm talking to who are in theater and in acting today. So maybe the mentality of the actors has changed significantly. Well, no, too. he was just special. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> there, there will special only is ever an be understatement. One, yeah. <laughs> there will only ever be one Stanley Kubrick. All right. So thank you. Hey, no problem. Glad to I'm sit in. Glad, glad you could sit in. We got a few more things to talk about, so feel I'll free to jump on in. We're recording sound on my stuff yep. anyway. Yeah, you're not but going anywhere. You're not going anywhere anyway, but thank you for the interview. And I'm glad to get you in front of the camera, even if it may be the only time in the uh, foreseeable future that it happens. No, we should, we should actually probably do this periodically for uh, the next year or so at least. While, I'm ra while I wrap up exposure, get that out, get out there just onto YouTube, and then start developing my actual thesis for next year. Because that's going to go through a much longer development process and is going to slowly drive me mad. So. <laughs> Could be watching fun to document that. that. Watching that and do document that de-evolution could be kind of fun. <laughs> All right. So I've got one more thing to talk about today. It's not news related. It's not video related. But it's just something I want to discuss. And that is having photography websites. Specifically, having a business website versus a portfolio versus an art website. Can you do them all together? Can you not do them all together? I know there's a lot of opinion on this, and there's no right way to do it. So that's why I wanted to have a little, just, just bring it up, see what you guys think about that concept. Because I've seen two very different portfolio or website reviews recently, and from two different people, and they have totally different views on how you should do things. <laughs> of course. Now, for, for, for my, my example here, you have, on one end, you have the Mark Wallace if you are a wedding photographer, your website should only be wedding photography mentality. And on the other end, you have the Jared Bolin, put everything you do well out there and don't put it out there if you don't do it well, but put everything out there mentality. So you, I want to see where you guys fall on that spectrum. Oh, I, I, I can jump in on that one right away. Um, the first guy, absolutely. With Mark Wallace. If you yeah. want to be successful at all, pick a specialty and just whore yourself out on that one specialty. Otherwise, you'll be a struggling artist the rest of your life. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, that's, that is true. That is very true that you want the specialty you want to have what you do very well showcased. At the same time, wedding photography is very specific for that because you're, you're going direct to consumers and you're not looking for um, commercial interests. Ryan, do you know why I'm not a wedding photographer? Because you don't like wedding people? wedding photography. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would never want to be, I, I would never want to start that. It's, never, ever. It's interesting. It's one of those things huh. that people hate a lot. It's that <laughs> people usually just don't do it. Yeah. The issue is that there's so many people doing it now for next to no money that it's very difficult to try and get real money yeah. and not get, not get crapped on for it, essentially. Um, wedding photography, you're marketing to a very specific person who has gone to bridal shows, who has seen thousands of things marketed at them solely on the purpose of weddings. It gets muddy the moment you try and do anything else. The moment that you do anything else, so if you want to be a commercial photographer, you need a broader portfolio than just your product shots. You know, you need, you need a good commercial base, which is kind of a broad statement, I think. You can have your specialties, and you can obviously specialize in whatever the hell you want to do if that's your you're good at it, you can specialize, but if you're looking, kind of scrapping for whatever commercial jobs you want, it, I could see having a broader website than that. It depends what your market is, or what, what your... I suppose that's true, I suppose that's true. But weddings, like I, I think if you have any wedding, wedding portraits, family, family portraits, any of that stuff, it should be its own very specific site. Like mine, I mean, peacepointphoto.com by itself is nothing but wedding shots. And it's, it's right. like... But that should be, your website should be a tool to get you jobs. And yeah. if you're relying on weddings for income, then that's it. That's what you should be showing people, yeah. I think. You're not going to convince someone that you're going to be an amazing wedding photographer with pictures of landscapes. No. Yeah. And that's uh, weddings, weddings very specifically need to do that. I've seen, it gets, so it, people are very interesting with the way that they combine portraits, fashion, boudoir, and weddings into a website, and it never, I've, I haven't seen it work right. <laughs> no, it really, it, it doesn't. You could do portraits and fashion, those can go together to some extent. Yeah. 
Boudoir probably shouldn't be tied into anything other than boudoir. Uh, nowadays, you can... Maybe you could tie it into fashion. You're not looking for fashion. It's weddings, really. It's, that's one of those things that actually does kind of shoot off of weddings in its own way. It's, I could see tying that in with weddings, depending on how you do it. All right. But that's not everybody. Yeah. So basically, one thing I think you two can agree on, and, and it's kind of where I was sitting before you guys even started talking, was your, wed your, your website should be to your target audience. Yeah. So if you're shooting, you know, again, we're going to use weddings as the bad example. If you are a wedding photographer, landscapes don't really work because you might take one landscape of like where the ceremony was if it was somewhere like a beach, but it's still not a landscape. It's like it's, it's, still it's not really never a landscape. purely a landscape. Yeah. So in that case, would you run multiple websites? This is my wedding website, but over here is my art website and over here is my landscape website or yeah so the way the way I've I've done this is I have peacepointphoto.com directs right to a wedding website once you're there you're stuck in a wedding website there's no links to anything else there's no sidebar for bring me here or there but peacepointphoto.com slash art so if I give somebody that URL I give somebody that business card it will bring you to a whole different section of the website that doesn't link back to the wedding part and from there you can see stuff At the same time a lot of art stuff now is social media based, Etsy based, Flickr, Tumblr, Instagram, Etsy, no. Pinterest. So you almost don't need. You just named everything I hate. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you have to hate it for the right reasons. It's like you have to hate it because you have to use it. That's that's why I hate it because I have to have these things. I have to work on them once in a while. Yep. I don't do it as much as I should. Nobody does it as much as they should because they're insane. But <laughs> yeah, it's. You only really need a static website so often, really, for a lot of anything considered art. Where do people buy art stuff from? Etsy. Honestly, like that's that's the big trading hub for a lot of art prints and yeah. anything yeah. like that. So that, that's how I run it. Is I, I have the wedding completely separate and the main focus, and then use just the URL. Yeah, I mean I I do that with Aperture to Pixels. It's a port it's a portrait site, I and mean, if you go there, it's all portrait stuff. Now, some of it is more high fashion, some of it's a little more fantasy, but it's all portrait stuff. It's all stuff that people I've worked with and brought their visions and my visions together and said, this is the, this is the pictures we're going to take. Um, but I do have other things, and they're, they're buried deep in that site right now, but they're still there. I need to figure out where else to put them. Because I have like the fine art stuff from like when we decided to destroy a pineapple for fun. and. <laughs> It, it was, was a commercial shoot. That's not a fine art shoot. <laughs> it was when we started throwing things around. Then it became art. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I've got a separate website just for the podcast because I don't want that. As much as I want the two of them to be related and that people will recognize me from one and, and the other, I don't count on AppTureChat.com and AppTureToPixels.com linking to each other. Hmm. It's... They're, they're totally separate elements in that, in, in my portfolio as I look at it. They're two totally separate elements because Aperture Chat is the podcast. And I do put pictures up there. You know, I, I, I think it's going to be a picture of the day and then I maybe update it once a week with, with the fresh picture. <laughs> um, I would like it to get to a point where I'm doing a picture of the day and that just means I need to spend more time here working on that website. Uh, but I've, I've at least got those split and I keep debating whether or not to take the art, the landscapes, and the other stuff, and put a third site out there for that alone. Um, I mean, I put all of it up on the Facebook page. It, it, everything goes there, regardless. I don't, I, the Aperture to Pixels Facebook page is just everything and everyone, and just kind of a, a catch-all for everyone I have involved with the studio in one way or another. That's kind of my, my problem, is that the Peace Point Photo Facebook page is weddings. So I can't catch all it, so I don't post a lot. You know, especially over the winter, I didn't post almost anything because I don't have wedding stuff to post. So it's one of those, should you use your name more often than not? A lot of photographers, that's what they say, is to always use your actual name, like John Holmes. Any, any, almost every photographer you can think of naming, they just use their name 
yeah. as their photography studio. So do we do you make another one? Do you have two or three different things floating around? It gets, gets <laughs> insane to keep well, track of? For me, that would be kind of tricky because before I picked the studio name, I actually went online and I've actually, yes, I Googled myself. Um, but there are already two other Thomas models who are photographers in the world. And I don't want to be like, they want them to think I'm trying to ride on their coattails or anything. I mean, it's... It is your name. You just have it, to be better is, than they are. Well, <laughs> one guy's close to retirement and he's in Germany. And the other one's in North Carolina. So at least the, geographically, I'm disparate from them. Uh, but I didn't want it to be tied to my name because... Mostly because if you punch in my name in Google, I'm not, I don't show up in any fashion until like page three. Which wow. you'd have to change. I would have to change, but to Which start. changes quickly with for photo stuff especially, but. Yeah. So, yeah. So for me, just using my name wasn't as much of an option as I wish it was. I, mine was open when I first started thinking about doing website stuff. My name was open and now I've looked again. I think the Facebook page is taken by someone who's not too far away either. <laughs> it's like, why? What? I messaged, they didn't get back to me, which kind of, how do you not get back to me? They're the same name, <laughs> photographers, come on. <laughs> But yeah, it is a very, it's kind of a tricky thing, but when it comes down to it, it's good work is good work and you can optimize it, but as long as it's out there, it's out there. Yeah. So, and one, one last thing about this is the idea of contributing to other people's websites. Like, I write for the Mediafile website, which you run. Yeah, like once. Twice. <laughs> I've written like two things. I write it. <laughs> I write it. But I also contribute to your podcast. I also do Absolutely. things with, with, with your website. I don't do anything with your website because it's all wedding related and you don't even do things with your website. I do things with my website. I <laughs> Just find, during I've, wedding season. No, yeah, but. I find a picture every six months that I put up there because <laughs> I have 10,000 pictures to go through looking for landscape pictures. <laughs> but do you guys see that, uh, I guess the question is, do you guys see putting yourself out on other websites as a good way to get your name out there or do you think it just kind of spreads you too thin? No, you should always be contributing and active in the community. Whatever you do, you should be active in that community because you'll never get far not being part of that community. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree completely. You need to be part of a community of creative people that can all support one another. Oh, yeah. So I guess that really wasn't much of a question. It was no. more of a just reaffirm, <laughs> say what I wanted to hear on camera. Yeah. Um, so that's really all I had for this week. Yeah, I can't um, think of anything else. Like, do you have anything else have anything to contribute, or you guys want to no. jump off into another tangent somewhere? Uh, just a couple of things to wrap up. I'd like to thank uh, Cola, uh, Chris Cosgrove, for being the first one to post on all of our videos so far. Uh, please, somebody beat him to it for episode well seven, because he'll probably beat you on six. Um, this is six. Wow. All yeah, right. this is six. So I'm asking someone post before he does on seven. <laughs> um, but it does mean we have somebody at least looking at our videos. Makes me feel a bit better. Oh God. Oh God, people are watching us. Um, also, we are still looking for an official beverage sponsor. We keep drinking Narragansett, but they're not giving us free beer. We drank too much Narragansett last have night. You, have you tweeted to them yet? I haven't good, because... They are good at Twitter. They are very good at Twitter and... Um, yeah, their social media is pretty damn good. I'm so sad. Did you ever watch in the can, the can trials for Narragansett no. on their Facebook page? So on their Facebook page every week, they've been bringing up old historical cans nice. and having people vote which one they want to remake for like next summer or something. Hmm. And I'm so angry at the one from the 80s one with like the sailing ships on it. It came down to the 1940s one, which is like the, the brass colored Gansett with the green logo hmm. or this 80s white with like sailing ships on it and a weird scribbly text and yeah. it's like of course the 80s ones wins because who follows Narragansett on a Facebook page not not a bunch of young people who go for the kind of cool retro can it's the yeah. but yep it's effective social media that's for damn sure yeah no I'll have to tweet uh, at them saying hey we mentioned your beer in our podcast and see what they have to say how about we drink your beer on screen on the podcast weekly for like half an hour at least. It's right there the entire time. You know, if we could drink it for free, that might be kind of cool. I, well, I'll have you craft that up better. You're much better wordsmith than no, I am, No, that's apparently. it right there. Just oh, good. Well, at least we have this on camera so I can <laughs> transcribe it later. <laughs> 
Twitter's hard. <laughs> it is. I actually sat on a plane when I was traveling a couple weeks ago, and because I didn't have access to the internet on the plane, I was like, oh, I'll save this draft, and then it went away. I spent like an hour trying to get my whole message into 140 characters. It should never be that long. It should never even be 140 characters. Yeah, that's not what Twitter's for, sir. You, sh you shouldn't struggle at Twitter. I struggle at Twitter. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think it's about that time. It's about yeah. that time. It's only been 51 minutes. All right. We'll see you next week. Why? Bye.